Greetings family, welcome back to the YouTube channel, what, the learning channel. I uh, want to present today, I think it's information on the past and our history as to why we seem to be in such a bad predicament. I mean, we just got people killing one another. We got so many destructive things happening in our community and we're doing it to ourselves. I mean, we got to stop blaming other people, but the reality is there's something going on in our history that has been neglected and we don't really deal with the, I guess, the realities of what has happened in our experience. So we're talking about slavery today, actually. So deliberate miseducation feeds self-hate. So on both sides of the colonizer and the colonized, by not knowing anything about the slave experience or what has happened internationally in the whole diaspora, creates a situation where we have irrational killings and that's nothing but self-hate. I mean, if you think about it, in the USA, people of African descent are living 160 years since being so-called emancipated, signed into freedom. So signed into freedom, and now we hear we are killing one another as if we don't even value one another. And the society has created a scenario where we don't value one another. So sadly, we are killing one another, living like Frankenstein, a created people manufactured to kill each other. So both the colonizer and the colonized display historical amnesia. When you think about the so-called woke culture, whatever is going on in these governorships and these mayorships and these places where people don't want to talk about the past, saying that it, I don't know what they're saying. They just say, don't talk about the past. Let's just move on. Well, when you don't talk about the past, that's when you start to have problems where you don't heal. So both the colonizer and the colonized display historical amnesia. So that is why society does not seem to be healing. We act like the psychological remnants of slavery do not exist. Uh, perhaps you've seen Amos Wilson's book, Black on Black Violence. Uh, he's written this and just listen to this passage about Black on Black Violence. The perpetual domination of African Americans by white Americans psychically requires the white American criminalization of the African male. That is, the white American perception of the African male is inherently criminal. And when I watch the news and read the news, all you see is black people killing one another. As if only black people are killing and only black people are self-destructive. In the context of white American domination, there is no innocent black male. Just black male criminals who have not yet been detected, apprehended, or convicted. Their mere presence inspires in white Americans fears of being assaulted, raped, murdered, robbed, or some other indefinable dread of being criminally victimized. Fantasies of sexual molestation, of white females being rapacious, black males are common to the white American male and female consciousness and are frequent themes of their literary, cinematic, and pornographic productions. Lastly, one of the other comments he makes is that the white American community must realize though it will not admit it, that crimes committed in the service of white American domination, that is, rape and robbery of nations, the murder and exploitation of native peoples of their lands, the denial of the humanity of non-European peoples, the enslavement, lynching, racial discrimination against and disenfranchisement of African Americans infinitely outweigh the alleged crimes of African American men. So, Let's equate the weights. When you look at what has done has been done internationally to peoples, it really does not even deal with the nature of the problems that are experienced uh, when you deal with the self-hate and this black on black violence. And you look at what has happened with countries and how they decimated people. Uh, let me have you walk through uh, walk through a little bit of history with me. Walk with me to see and remember the days of slavery take the time and look at the images and then i will return and we will show we shall discuss some books and conclude with high recommendations of books to uh, read such as slavery at sea uh, by swandi mustaki terror sex and sickness in the middle passes we'll conclude with this one but uh if we remember all of this i guarantee we would not be treating each other so badly Therein lies the problem with our experience as African people. Don't know our experience. So let me uh, play a little bit of this 
as we look at some of these images. Slavery days. remembering the path we've taken to get to where we are today it puts in perspective why we have so much destruction so at the root of the problem of this terror is the breakdown of the black family if you're going to take all these Africans from all these places Africans as commodity as human cargo just take them all over the place and put them in other areas of the world you've destroyed their family unit beyond the family unit you got economic violence generation of insane economic disparities have created a situation where these African countries are unable to survive with the foot of the colonizer on the neck of these African countries. Let's look at some problems that exist then. This is 1880 to 1914. So again, this is after our so-called Emancipation Proclamation there in the United States. But look what's going on in Africa and all the problems that are going on. Where you see that brown it's the Portuguese. You see that gray? It's the Germans. You see all that pink? That's the British. And then the French up here in the in French West Africa and colonizing Ivory Coast and Gabon. So over here on the right, on your on, on the left side there says number one, Rose, British South Africa Company Pioneer. Basically, back there in the days, they were killing off Africans to steal this land down here in northern and southern Rhodesia, which have been renamed to Zambia and Zimbabwe. But you got these places down here that were fighting the Africans for controlling their own land. Right there in the uh, Namibia, this is German Southwest Africa. After that, Germans lost World War II. They had to go ahead and now give up that territory. But Namibia, that's where they practiced the first Black Holocaust. We get a book by Furpro Carr in with Germany's first black holocaust where they were decimating the Africans, the Heru, Heru people down there in Namibia. So you got Angola and then you move up here to the Congo. I just finished reading a book called White Malice. But even in White Malice, there's another book called King Leopold's Ghost. It's about this guy named Henry Morton Stanley who traveled the world and 
was funded by King Leopold II to go steal the land from the people with these concocted treatises. And, oh man, it's just so sad to see what we went through and what we experienced. It gives a, this book right here by Adam Oxchild really gives a breakdown of what happened there in the Congo region, right there in the center of Africa, where all the resources are. Big at Stanleyville, again, white man named places after him. So looking at this colonization here, you see what these numbers here is talking about what happened during the time periods in those areas of the world. Stanley's exploration, 1877, and then 1879, these guys were there for the Belgians. So the Belgian Congo, that's a little teeny place in Europe, small, but they controlled that one area called a republic. You think about in 1989, decades ago, 8990, this is looking at human development. Australia and the United States, Canada, the European countries, and also basically up there in Europe. All those places of greater human development because of the way the European had colonized other people, taken, taken the people, extracted their land and its resources, and so the other places become what decimated. So when you look at the places, this places that have lower human development in the yellow, see there's a lot going on in Africa and over there in, in Asia. But you see the United States, Canada, and the places like Australia, and Europe, they have greater human development and not much has really changed, even though there's a lot of change going on in some of these countries, but the human development index is still low. Commodities since the late 18, 1980s. Africa has all the resources. It's like also in South America, there's a lot of resources, Bolivia, Peru. Uh, you think about there in, in in the middle of the United, well, the middle of Africa with the resources like uranium to make these atomic bombs, uh, also with the, the diamonds and the copper and all these other minerals, all these resources are there in Africa are what the European powers thrive on. So that's why Australia, United States, and the European powers maintain their strength. When Africans control their resources, that's when those other powers will start to just diminish. That's why that's not going to happen. That's why we have to start thinking consciously about what's happening with the worldwide economic changes. Think about change. It happens when people have information. Look at this. World communications, radios, and newsprint in 1988, decades ago. It's pretty limited in the on the African continent. But the places with the greater amount of newsprint are the places that are heavily brown. United States again. Canada, Australia, Europe, other places where it's kind of difficult for people to get information, information out, it explains why there's such oppression in those areas. And then when you think about oppression and media control, where you see these bars, the bars really represent uh, not free in terms of they're able to disseminate, ability to disseminate information. This is prior to the internet age, but since the internet age has happened and occurred, you have some countries that are locking people down so they can't actually get their information out but where you see the white that means more free united states canada and again australia and most of europe those other places it's been kind of a lockdown on information so when you see those bars like mexico you see with peru got a coup going on in peru right now russia you see the russian war now going on in ukraine all these areas have been having lockdowns on media control so what i want to do now i want to share with you some uh, information on some books. Some books. Now, I have several books that I deal or have with that deal with slavery. And I want to share a few with you, but conclude with a strong sister named Suwande Mustakin, Dr. Suwande Mustakin, who's written an excellent book. And I did a book review on it, and I'll give a synopsis on that here. But, uh, a lot of the pe people have discussed this book over the years. If We Must Die. It says, Shipboard Insurrections in the Era of the Atlantic Slave Trade, written by a white man named Eric Robert Taylor. He's now changed his, I guess, theme in terms of his work, and now he's working in Hollywood media and making television programs and doing some things outside of writing text. So he takes this out of Claude McCain's poem called If We Must Die. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and pinned in inglorious spot. While round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, make their mock 
at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed. In vain, then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What thou for us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, or fighting back. Claude McKay, if we must die. So takes that title, makes this book, and you start reading it from the beginning. You read about the lies that Europeans had done when they were taking these Africans on these journeys across the ocean, capturing them, and massacring them, marauding them. And so just the lies that were told from the beginning about, let's say, some revolt on a ship and the Europeans were using that because they really wanted to kill their captain was all them peoples were fighting one another. You were just a commodity as a, as a human cargo, but you weren't really a human being. But just the stories, almost 500 insurrections that are documented by this particular scholar. So if we must die, if you get a chance to get that book, excellent. I already told you about King Leopold's ghost. It's really beyond the slavery days, but it's talking about, man, these people, Europeans, these devils were cutting off people's hands. If you weren't bringing enough of the commodity, which was rubber, cutting off people's hands and people didn't know about the story as it was blind to that information. People didn't know, didn't know that this was actually happening in a whole nother country, but there are people that were actually traveling around and like you saw those images of me in Africa, in uh, Colombia, Colombia, and then in Brazil, I got a chance to go to those places and got a chance to teach and speak. As I'm teaching and speaking, you understand how much people really don't know about what's going on in their experience. Even that word middle passage, when I was in Brazil, they hadn't even heard of that concept of middle passage. It's not taught by the Portuguese to them African Brazilians. Another book called The Slave Ship, A Human History by Marcus Redeker. So uh, definitely a, a very important book to have. It talks about the evolution of slave ship, uh, African path to the middle passage. It talks about Oladu Equiano, an African who gave his story about what he experienced, because sometimes you're hearing all the stories about the European experience, but not necessarily what's happening from the person who's being subjugated. You'll usually hear that story. Uh, there are a couple of books I have on the American Negro slavery. Uh, this is just in terms of happen what's happening here on the, on the land, not the Middle Passage. Before we get to the Middle Passage, we're dealing with a few topics of, again, what happened during our experience here. If you don't study this, guess what? It might happen again. One of the clearest and simplest reads on the uh, Ma'afa or the slave experience called The Black Holocaust by S.C. Anderson. I definitely recommend this as an easy read. Uh, it can be very, it can be used for uh, teaching children and also adults, so it's for, so it's for beginners. S.C. Anderson, The Black Holocaust. And then uh, a few books that deal with the slave experience here on land. This is the Atlantic slave trade, and we gotta really start questioning this word trade because you can't call stick up a trade. That's what was going on. They're actually capturing people, taking people, but it wasn't like an even exchange. So it wasn't really a trade, it was massacre. This is uh, by Herbert Klein called the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, Dr. John Henry Clark has documented some work in slavery and the slave trade. He's edited this document, but it's a very good resource on discussing the, uh, I guess, commentaries on what happened during slavery. So we all know that's a John Henry Clark. Anything he has written, has documented, and has spoken about, must know his information. And then, so you'll be talking about American slave experience. We never, well, we seldom get a chance to talk about revolts, just like the, the book I just discussed called If We Must Die. It's talking about slave revolts, insurrections. Well, we also have Herbert Apthecker. Herbert Apthecker wrote a book called American Negro Slave Revolts. So again, this is really on land and not so much on the ship, 
but we have to look at these stories so that they don't happen again. Two books that are common in this topic, uh, John Blassingame's book called The Slave Community, Plantation Life and the Antebellum South. So John Blassingame, usually in conjunction with a book by Kenneth Stamp called The Peculiar Institution. If you get a chance to get this, it really talks about the uh, uh, experience there, there in the South where slavery was entrenched, but the peculiar institution, uh, interesting titles, some of them have been turned into, uh, I guess, it, it book movies or movies. Uh, from Day Clean to First Duck. A troublesome Property. That was about Nat Turner. To Make Them Stand in Fear. Chattel. Chattel's Personal. Slave Mongering. Maintenance, Morbidity, Mortality. Between Two Cultures. Profit and Loss. He Who Has Endured. And so basically, this is a foundational book in terms of the slave experience here in the United States. Uh, some other books, The Origins of American Slavery. Uh, we have to look at Betty Wood's work. Talks about what's happened here in the, in the English colonies and how bondage occurred. So resources, that's what we're talking about, resources. Another one was called American Slavery by Peter Colson. The dates here are 1619 to 1877, but again, when we study what has happened and how people were confined and why they were confined, how they were maintaining those environments, you start to understand a little bit better what is still going on today. Another uh, popular book, along with Kenneth Stamp and John Blassingame, is Basil Davidson's work. He wrote a book called The African Slave Trade. Again, we've got to still question this word trade, but that's what we're working with and that's what we have to document. When we start studying it, to understand the dynamics of how we've been continually controlled, we won't be calling a trade anymore. And then the last two books, uh, Fighting the Slave Trade, written by uh, or edited by a sister named Sylvain Duoff. Sylvain Duoff. Picture of her right there. So she's edited this book to talk about again people fighting. This is not just here in in, in the on the North American continent was talking about what's African strategies to fight slavery, the slave trade. And then uh, enslaving connections. This is really looking at Brazil and other places beyond Brazil, but I got a chance to spend some time in Brazil. And this is a very important document because it talks about changing cultures of Africa and Brazil during the era of slavery. This is written, edited by Jose Curto and Paul E. Lovejoy enslaving connections so i want to conclude though today on slavery at sea terror sex and sickness in the middle passage i did a book review uh several years ago on this one and let me go ahead and see if i can give you a little uh breakdown of this work by dr mustakin he's a professor of st louis washington university st louis Intentionally unremembered are the profound words expressed by Sawande Mustakim as she writes about our recall of the Middle Passage. In her dynamic book, Slavery at Sea, Terror, Sex, and Sickness in the Middle Passage, the author delves into a topic that we neglect to recognize as a critical missing component to combat historical amnesia. The physical capture of humans, the storage of black bodies, and the transport and exploitation human cargo was all done in a terroristic manner. Mustakim informs us that slavery at sea provides a more textured understanding of how human power, human pain, and economic greed enacted cycles of tragedies that span centuries, memory, time, and space. In this current age, we are still feeling the pain. That's why I'm saying black people are killing one another, not knowing what we went through in the past. If we knew, we might not be killing one another. We respect one another. Right now, we've been told nothing about our history and our past. Slavery at Sea is groundbreaking exploration into a time period we assume was only a boat ride across the ocean. When I was in Brazil, and again, I'm lecturing and they never heard of the concept Middle Passage. Hmm. The topic is nothing to be excited about because the experience during the Middle Passage was horrific. 
However, we can be encouraged by the meticulous data collected in research presented by Mustakim as extraordinary. Her primary sources come from very broad categories, which the author labels as personal, professional, financial, and public resource. She actually traveled there to Liverpool, those places where the ships were actually constructed, where the money was being dealt with in terms of insurance, so that when they made the trips abroad to these other countries and got this cargo, people would still get paid if they lost the cargo. Mustakim has traveled to some of the locations where the slave ships embarked in Europe, docked in Africa, and transported the bonds people. That's right, I think that's called them slaves. They were bonds people. She is commended for humanizing the captives because they were more than human cargo and quote, things, unquote. They were people with a past, a life, and a history. The bloody insurrections, the emotional scars on bonds people, the war-induced blemishes, and the unknown scenes of violence have caused physical and psychological trauma that has lasted for generations. So when we're seeing all this destruction in our communities right now where we're killing one another, families destroying one another, that didn't start yesterday. This is generations of just clear mental slavery call it now menticide. There is no mystery or fictitious accounts to this horrendous story because Mustakim has gone to the original sources for documentation. This provocative author takes a less traditional lens to provide the visible and invisible injuries and scars the captives incurred through slavery at sea. The introduction of the book contains a thorough explanation of studies that have explored the birth of slavery at sea. Along with the seven chapters, there is also an epilogue containing Mustakim's description of slavery at sea. As a comparison to Frankenstein that I mentioned earlier, according to Mustakim, the slave ex ship experience concretely parallels the abominable and man-like monster comprised of the stitched together parts of the dead and the living embodied in the impermeable fusion of both creator and his creation. See how she works those words? In seven chapters, the author links the financial roots of the massive traffic of black bodies for capital gain. It was an industry focused on the human manufacturing process. And how can this be any different than the capitalistic enterprise and the need to acquire black bodies today? It is a cycle of terror that we cannot break until we fully recognize the past. It was not skinny white women or little children or elderly that were sought. The instigators of the slave system primarily sought black men as the most desired cargo. Muscle was needed for the heavy work required for this terroristic enterprise. Exploiting black men was at the root of this terroristic tree and the branches of this rotten tree extended to the prison industrial complex, the sports industry, that is like NCA March Madness, it's March now and that's what's going on, and the persistent police brutality industry. And again, we saw it happen in Memphis, you got brothers killing brothers. If the people Mustakim attempts to humanize are only viewed as quote things unquote to be controlled, manipulated and killed without consequences, this fully explains why the horrific, horrific cycle has not been broken. Likewise, the physical abuse and sexual exploitation of black women captives was devastating to the human spirit. And Mustakim highlights the objectification of women and how this objectification has been persistent for generations. The first story she tells in the introduction is about a woman who was thrown overboard because the captain deemed her worthless for sale. This Bonds woman was thrown overboard like a piece of trash. Despite this horrific experience, she momentarily survived the shark-infested waters below the ship. From this nameless soul to Fannie Lou Hamer to Sandra Bland, this terroristic system has continually abused strong black women. Slavery at Sea gives systematic attention to the body than any books on the topic. According to the author, the body serves as the most efficient access point for understanding the past and ex the exacting tolls of human life and death. Without studying what happened at sea, we cannot properly analyze the generational legacies still operative today. It was pure violence and not a cruise ship on carnival or rural Caribbean cruise lines. 
This book reveals a holistic treatment of an industry and terror producing system that devastated the lives of an incalculable many through the normalized continuation of the transatlantic slave trade for nearly 400 years. We cannot just forget that time period as insignificant. The seven chapters cover a wide array of topics to explore the deep effect on the mental, physical, and spiritual nature of the Bonds people. In chapter one, Waves of Calamity, the documented stories of kidnapping and the interplay between middlemen, Bonds people, slave ship sailors, and financiers uncovered. The inland traders developed a callous disregard for captives, and the foreign traders were unmoved by the circumstances that led that landed the slaves into bondage. In chapter two, Imagined Bodies, the author gives a detailed analysis of the valuation of slaves measured for the possibility of financial interests. Specific needs for bondsmen and bondwomen are extracted from the reviewed resources. For example, bondwomen were evaluated according to displays of beauty and the sexual reproductive capacity they possessed. In chapter three, Health he desires toxic realities. There is a clear description of how Bonds people's lives were under constant attack, not only from inclement weather, but also from contamination and the lack of protections from the onslaught of daily environmental risks. More gruesome stories are told in chapter four, Blood Memories. Ideas of violence could sufficiently prepare slayer sailors for their confined interaction with Bond people. Guns, like today, were used as a means of exerting terror and creating some semblance of protection aboard slave ships. The gun fostered abstract feelings of power to constrain unpredictable black behaviors. The enforcement of ship security was based on the belief of hyper-aggressive bond people. There is no difference compared to our current time in history, and Mustakin reminds us even more than the mass congregation of all slaves, two men were most fearful of adult black men. As we look back in history, prevailing fears of unrest centered on black men on the slave ship are now pervasive on the streets of civilized society. In chapter five, battered bodies and enfeebled minds, the tragedies surmount, and we understand why sharks developed a taste of humans. During the Middle Passage, boarded slaves were faced with two critical choices, endure captivity or escape through death. In chapter six, the anatomy of suffering, tightened spaces of ships, the closeness of bodies and lack of proper cleanliness impose staggering effects on transported captives. In the final chapter seven, a tide of bodies, the realization of the pain is highlighted. From the middle passage, the captives carry with them the remnants of traumatic manifestations and memories of terrorizing violence, visible and invisible, endured on the ocean waterways, thereby problematizing the idea that captives were really ever able to move beyond the middle passage. To conclude, one of the most scintillating scenes and phrases from the blockbuster movie Black Panther was a statement by Eric Killmonger when he was prepared to die. He stated, quote, bury me in the ocean with my ancestors who jumped from the ships because they knew death was better than bondage, unquote. Killmonger may have been fictional, but he was aware of the middle passage. Slavery at sea is nonfiction and we should read it to properly process moving forward. In some, we should take heed and follow this revolutionary focus in fighting against the ongoing oppression stemming from the terrorism of the Middle Passage. According to Ms. Mustakim, quote, without protections in place to counter the abuses routinely suffered in running away from slavery by jumping overboard, bond people asserted control over their lives, regardless of the hazards lurking beneath. Understand the beast, my people. I'm just saying that. Understand the beast because you will continually be the feast. So, hopefully you've learned something and the importance of why I'm saying we have to study the slave experience because again, why we're killing one another today is because of self-hate. And self-hate produces self-destruction. Self-destruction creates a situation where our community is out of control. 
so much respect for the sister for writing that strong book and again amongst all the other books please read don't just look at the videos of what's on Netflix don't just look at the information that you're seeing in the cinema in the movies you gotta know the sources once you go to the sources you understand a little bit better so thanks for spending some time working that black family family period working that economic upliftment for all and we shall have a way to fight thanks for spending some time